And all of us, when we were leading formation, we had a snake name. I was Mamba. Mamba. Can this stop and go behind like this and lock this plane? No. 65 war, our army reached to Lahore and they were called back. Prime Minister Shastri expressly forbade Air Marshal Arjun Singh, the chief of the Air Force, from using the Air Force. Then it struck me, I said, oh hell, this is the runway I was supposed to bomb in 1971. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So these days they are coming out with a sustainer motor, a small ramjet which keeps who keeps following you. Yeah, pushing the missile with energy all the time right up to impact. So okay, those missiles are very difficult to evade. And um, but they're also extremely expensive, about two million dollars a missile. So oh, wow! So unless the target is really big, you won't be using those. It's okay. It's a four hundred million plane, and that you can put a. Yeah, if you're shooting a four hundred million plane, fair enough. But, but if you're trying to shoot a hundred thousand dollar drone with it, it doesn't make sense. sense. <laughs> 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 we'll straight away move to nineteen sixty five war. It's my privilege. That I'm sitting in front of you. 65 war. You were all of 24. Yet you did 22 sorties that time. And the biggest thing you told me before as well uh, when we chatted, there were friends on the other side. Yes. Who had become enemies that time. Soon after the Chinese problem in 1962. Right. Um, and the United States had offered to train some fighter pilots from the Indian Air Force and gunnery on the F-86 Sabre. So 80 pilots went from India, then 10 batches of 8. And I was in the fourth batch and I went to the US and I flew the F-86 Sabre at a place called Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. Right. And when I reached Las Vegas, I was um, not yet 23, I was 22 something. And uh, we had Pakistanis flying with us in the same training unit. And uh, we were great friends. We were living in the same bachelor's quarters on the base. We used to have biryani parties and uh, a bunch of really nice guys. And we all parted company in September 1964. And in September 1965, we were shooting at each other. So that's... That's the way it is. That's how the war goes. Yeah. yeah. But in the uh, uh, 65 war, our army reached to Lahore and they were called back. Do you have that regret that why did they call it back, uh, the political pressure? Or you like, it's okay, jo ho na tha, wo ho gaya, that's okay. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, you know what, Prime Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru had passed away, Lal Bahadur Shastri was the Prime Minister. It was not even three years since the Chinese had given us that very bad uh, defeat right. in the Northeast and in Ladakh. And so Prime Minister Shastri was under great pressure not to allow the war to escalate in something much bigger, which would invite the interference from the Chinese. From the Chinese and, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. A fear which we now know is unfounded because the Chinese are not in a position to interfere. But that time it was a very real worry. When the Indian Army advanced across the international border on the 6th of September, that was the time we should have been over Pakistani airfields shooting up their aircraft on the ground. Right. But, but we were not allowed to do that. Prime Minister Shastri expressly forbade Air Marshal Arjun Singh, the Chief of the Air Force, from using the Air Force okay. in, in that offensive role. So we had to wait. And on the sixth evening, they hit us badly in Bhutan Court and Halwara and Adampur and so on. And then we had to react on the seventh morning. And on the seventh morning, we went, we went to Salvoda. They were expecting us. So right. we had a lot of uh, losses. We did cause some damage there, but we also had losses. So that is the way uh, the higher direction of war took place, but we, we couldn't complain because we are, after all, soldiers. But then there is a story you told me that uh, uh, you were flying with General Parvez Musharraf, and while you were landing, you said, oh, this airstrip we were supposed to bombard. And that was thank God it is there. The 71 war. What happened in 71 war? 71 war, you know, uh, in, on the 1st of February, the Indian Air Force formed a unit called the Tactics and Combat Development Establishment. And new combat uh, tactics, you know, missiles were coming in and the Air Force had to change. So, the Specialist Unit was formed and I was one of the pilots posted to that unit. And this was in February 71. 
In March of 25th of March 1971, the crackdown started in East Pakistan. And we all knew at that time that there would be a war. And sometime in the month of June or July, our unit was moved out from Adampur to Ambala. And in September, we were given a specific role to bomb Pakistan, single aircraft raids over Pakistan airfields at night, right. mainly to harass them so that they keep awake all night. Don't worry about where you drop the bomb as long as you drop it on the airfield, you know. MiG-21 and Sukhoi 7s did this role and we were training to hit this role. And my we were supposed to operate from Amritsar and fly for about 23 to 25 minutes low level at 100 meters above the ground on a dark night. Okay. Using only the compass and the stopwatch. Um, pull up on time over the target and drop the bomb and come back. And the target allotted to me was uh, Chaklala, the Chaklala runway. Right. So in 2005, when I went to Pakistan as a, at the invitation of Parvez Mutsharaf, who happened to be my course mate at the Royal College of Defence Studies in 1990, when he became the president, we had a reunion, college reunion there. And... Um, he organized a trip for us to fly from Chaklala to a place called Chitral, which is right up in the hills in right. the Hindukus Mountains. So we were sitting in this Pakistani Air Force C-130 Hercules right. transport, uh, 16 officers and 16 wives, when Air Marshal Aliuddin, who was the Air Force counterpart at the Royal College, he said, hey, Raj, you want to... <coughs> come up to the cockpit. I jumped at the opportunity I went and sat between the two pilots when we started rolling down the runway. Then it struck me, I said, oh hell, this is the runway I was supposed to bomb in 1971. <laughs> <laughs> but 71 war situation for Air Force was not like Jackie Shroff saying, ki ye subay kab hogi, ye subay kab hogi, and then there is a sunrise, then only you can uh, fly the planes. Uh, you know, the 71 war was largely, the air war was largely concentrated in the e eastern sector. But I must tell you one thing, in October 1971, I was sent off to France to be trained as a test pilot. So I okay. didn't fly in the 71 war. Okay. But, uh, but I was preparing to do this particular mission I spoke about. But um, the 71 war, the, the main action was in the east. There was something going on in the west, but... Uh, it was more of a holding action. And of course, the Air Force played a very major role in a place called Longewala in the desert. Right. In where the Pakistani armored thrust was stopped almost entirely by the Indian Air Force. Right. But you know, the one of the proudest moments again uh, came when uh, we got back Abhinandan. Abhinandan, yeah. when he dropped in uh, Pakistan and he was sent back to us. Yeah. And then that was, you're talking about the 2019, uh, was it 2019? 20, 2019, yeah. yes. 2019. Uh, yeah. What was your call sign? Because see, we, we see all the movies and all, we see all the call signs. We see Tom Cruise called uh, Maverick and then there's Goose. What was your call sign? Didn't have a particular call sign. Each squadron was given a, a name, like, for example, the number one squadron was Tiger. Red. Uh, Tiger 10 was the CO. Okay. And so on down the line. So the junior most guy was probably Tiger 24 or something. Okay. Uh, like that. Which Tiger were you? In the, during the war, we fly in formations red, white, blue, pink, whatever. Right. Uh, when we went to Sarboda, it was Red 4. Okay. Red 4. Yeah. That was only for you. My leader was Red 1. Red, Red 1 was the wingman, Red 3 was my leader subsection and I was Red 4. Red uh, 4. Yeah. So those kind of call signs you see in movies, but um, in actual fact they are more prosaic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> who are the coolest call sign? Who, who was the coolest uh, when, when you were flying? Uh, when we were, uh, when I was a flight commander in 3 squadron in Pathan Court in 77-78, uh, three squadron, uh, the emblem is a cobra. 
Right. So three squadrons were called the Cobras. And uh, we had the names of snakes. You know, all of us, when we were leading formations, we had a snake name. The CO was Cobra 1, Cobra 2, and so on. Okay. And uh, I was Mamba. Mamba? Yeah. Wow. Mamba 1, yeah. You were Mamba 1? Wow. Yeah. The black Mamba, the yes. poisonous snake. Yes. How many how many planes have you taken down? I have not shot down any planes. No planes, no dog fights for you. No, I was in a ground attack squadron uh, during the sixty five war, and in seventy one also we were only tasked for a ground attack mission. Right. Uh, not an air to air mission. Yes. So I I didn't shoot down anybody. Sixty five war happened. You were the war heroes. What was the reaction of the public? Did they know that you were the war heroes? No, at that time, uh, there was no social media, there was no TV. Oh. And letters from Bangalore to Adhanpur used to take probably four days or five days to reach us. I must say, south of the Vindhyas, um, people, didn't, I don't think they were even aware that a war was going on. Asha. Because it lasted only 22 days. Whereas Punjab, which is right there. Uh, which was the war. Yeah, there was a lot of awareness in Punjab about the war. And after the war, um, we were invited to some villages and the village Pradhan used to uh, sing our praises and so on. But uh, uh, in the large towns, I don't think anybody knew what was going on. Okay. But one of the most important time in your life was uh, when you were the project director for the first indigenous uh, light combat aircraft which was made in India wholly in India and it took the flight we also talked uh, that a lot of people discouraged that time that this plane won't fly Tejas project started off with something called the light combat aircraft project in 2003 2001 it got, got, got the, the name Tejas that's right uh, so when the light combat aircraft project started in 1986, there were some new technologies which were being incorporated in it. And all, we were going to attempt to do all that in India. So the Air Force had a lot of misgivings. They said, no, no, you can't straight away jump into the program like this. We have to do a technology demonstration program. Demonstrate the technologies and then we'll take a call. In 86, the project started. Then by 1991, you know, the government ran out of money. Uh, we were pawning our gold stocks to the Bank of England and so on. By the time we got full funding, it was 1993 to, for the technology demonstration program. And at that time, the um, Dr. Abdul Kalam was the scientific advisor. He asked for my services to be loan to the aeronautical development agency because I had specialized as a test pilot. So he says I want I was an air vice marshal. So I came to Bangalore in September ninety four, that is um, thirty years ago. And I started I set up the National Flight Test Center, which was exclusively exclusively devoted to the test program of the LCA. And when we had done about seventy five flights the Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee said, I want to see this aircraft you guys say you made and all that. So he came and he gave the name Tejas. This was in May of 2003. And eventually, after a 5,000 flight test program, and the aircraft went into service with a full operational clearance without a single accident. So, you know, wow. that's uh, quite an achievement. And Mr. Modi just took a ride in Tejas recently. And uh, last year in 2023, the government has placed an order for 83 plus 97, that is 180 aircraft worth 115,000 crores. So that's the kind of saving the country has made. So it, it was a successful program. It, time because we had not uh, tested out the technologies before. Right. But um, in the end, it has worked out. Yeah. But what's the future of uh, uh, Air Force now? We know um, we have ordered Rafales, a lot of Rafales are coming now. We also ordered uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles. The cruise missiles. My question is, 
you know, everybody is saying China is surrounding us. China is going everywhere. They're making the Silk Roads. Are we standing on a greater footing? You see, China has a long land border with us. Right. Um, um, 3,000 or 4,000 kilometer long land border stretching from Ladakh to Arunachal Pradesh. But China has a great weakness. That is, all their energy supplies come from the Gulf. And they have to go through uh, two choke points. The Strait of Hormuz and the Malacca Strait here. So there, we, we have now got Sukhoi 30 is based in Tanjavur, which armed with the Brahmos missile, anti-shipping missile, they can cover these two choke points. So the Chinese are very aware of that, and I don't think they will ever push things to an extent where a hot war starts off because they know their vulnerability. Right. And also, it's very important to rem remember that between India, Pakistan and China, nuclear deterrence is operated. All three are nuclear powers. Great. So there will be no major war because of threat of nuclear escalation. So it will always be below the nuclear threshold. Some little border skirmishes, some irritants, mainly to keep the pressure on India. So pressure is building everywhere. I'll get I'll get to the pressure now, which uh, builds when uh, somebody is in the aircraft. I've asked this before as well. When you uh, uh, have the water pressure, when you are flying in a jet, what what do they do? How do they cope uh, with that? Ah, now when I was flying, we used to fly relatively short missions, right? Um, between forty-five minutes and an hour and a half maximum. But nowadays, with aerial refueling, people are flying for five hours, six hours. Going, going up to ten hours. hours. Yeah, ten hours. So, they have a problem. So, they wear diapers. They wear diapers. They also raise the cockpit temperature slightly high, so that you sweat more, and that relieves the pressure on the bladder. So, diapers are the way they cope with that. Is there air, air conditioning, conditioning inside? Yes, yes, very much. Okay. okay. You, can, you can control the corporate temperature. Right. Nice. nice. After flying the jets, do you feel the need for speed when you drive the cars uh, on road, on Bangalore roads? Ah, and strange that you asked me the question because when I was chief test pilot here at the aircraft and systems testing establishment, I used to fly a variety of aircraft, and the Canberra, the MiG-21, the Jaguar and all. And I used to get onto my Chetak scooter and drive home. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was quite a drastic change. But um, I never felt the need to speed on the road and uh, have an accident because it didn't make sense. Okay. So, you adapt to the environment you are in. But it was quite a strange feeling after flying a MiG, uh, supersonic MiG. To get on to Mark my Chetak scooter. Ma yeah. Mark, Mark, two, Mark, two, Mark two. Mark two. And yeah. Mark three to sort of yeah. yeah. Chalta. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the strangest encounter you have had while flying? Strangest incident I would say is uh, when I was in Iraq, I was a combat instructor. So I spent two years in a place called Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown. Right. Um, in the, between 1981 October and 83 October. So while I was there, two things happened. One is Pakistani Air Force officer called Wing Commander Cecil Chowdhury, the much decorated hero of both the 65 and 71 wars. He was in the same squadron as I was in the Iraqi Air Force. And we flew together in the same formation. Okay. We briefed and debriefed and... Um, train the Iraqi cadets together. And uh, Shasil Chaudhary was again a very nice guy. I mean, we, we got along well together. So that was one. Second was, um, one day in the middle of the desert, there's a base called Saad Air Force Base towards the Jordan border. So we had moved there and um, the base commander came up and asked me, he said, are you a test pilot, I said, yes, I am. He says, I need your help. I said, what can I do for you? He says, you come with me. And he took me in his car to the hangar, 
where there are a lot of bamboo crates, you know, woven bamboo right. crates made out of that with bitumen for waterproofing from which they're pulling out disassembled minks, fuselage, okay. wings, oh, fin and no. all that. And there were Chinese technicians erecting this, putting it all right. together. And um, he said, I want you to fly these. I, I said, sure, show me the flight manual. And he showed me the flight manual, it was in Mandarin. Okay. Then I went and sat in the cockpit and I found that the cockpit was identical to the cockpit of the MiG we were flying in Iraq. A version called the F-13. So I said, maybe the switches also behave the same way. So I connected up the battery and the hydraulic power and checked out all the switches and all that. And they were all identical. Okay. Then I asked for the ejection seat manual. Fortunately, the ejection seat was a Martin Baker seat made in England. So the manual was in English. English. So I knew the safety limitations of the seat and all that. Then I asked for the engine manual. The engine manual was produced with a Chinese engine, also in Mandarin. Uh -huh. But I could make out the RPMs and the jet pipe temperatures and oil pressure and all that. So I made a note of all that. And um, <coughs> then I said, yes, I'm ready to go. And I got airborne. The aircraft flew very well. Hey. I did the air test profile. You didn't have to eject? And no. no. Okay. Yes, uh, no, I was prepared, prepared to do that. that. <laughs> but it, uh, it behaved and uh, then I did four more of those tests for four more aircraft. Then I went and briefed all the other Indian instructors and everybody started flying it. So that was a strange experience flying a Chinese aircraft without reading the flight manual. Right. And an opportunity to see what Chinese have achieved in the aeronautical industry. Right. What's... What's your favorite song which comes in your head all the time? These days it is My Way by Frank Sinatra. Okay. Yeah. Can, Can you sing two lines for us? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Any any other song, any any Bollywood song? I I don't watch too many Hindi films. Okay. okay. I want to see two movies, Sam Badur and Fighter, which I right. see one of these days. Yeah. Sam Badur was actually like this that hi Philip, how are you doing? We gonna talk. Was he actually like this? The field marshal Manikshaw had settled down in Kunur right. after retirement. retirement. And I went to do staff college in Kunur in January of 1976. Right. Jan to December was the uh, course. Wellington. And Wellington. So soon after landing up there, my, our daughter was only all of uh, how old was she? Three years old. So okay. So we had gone down to Kunur on my scooter to buy her some shoes. I was sitting in the bata shop when who should walk in the field marshal himself in his jeans and his khaki pullover and uh, with two of his Gorkha johnnies. Really? So I immediately jumped up and I said, uh, good morning, sir. I'm squadron leader so-and-so and this is my wife. So he said, Oh, I'm sure it is your wife. It's too early in the course for you to be out with someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was Sam. The funny man. Yeah. But very, very strong. Man. Yeah, great man. Yeah. Did Indra Gandhi have crush on him? No, I don't think no? so. But uh, she relied on him a lot. Sure. Right. You know, I have seen this with my own eyes in uh, 1971, June. I had gone to the Obro Intercontinent. Those days, Obro Intercontinental was one of the, was the only five-star right. hotel in Delhi. And it had a disco called Tabellas. Okay. And Tabellas, the glitterati of Delhi would be there every evening. And I have seen Sam Manikshaw's white Chevrolet's staff car with his red four-star plate standing in the porch and Sam would be in Tabellas in the evening okay. with his wife. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He, he deserved all, all yeah. that. The, um, 
the only field marshal we had in the yeah. independent India. Great man, great man. man. Yeah. Did your plane have a name? Did you give give it a name? No. And if uh, you get a chance to give it a name, what name would you give? Sheila. Sheila. Why? Because Sheila ki jawani. Yeah. Like um, Chuck Yeager when he went supersonic, he went su- in 1947. His rocket plane, he had called it Glamorous Glynis. Okay. Glynis was his wife. So I'd probably call it Glamorous Sheila. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I can handle this Sheila. The other Sheila is handling me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get a lot of uh, ladies' attention since you were in Air Force, and you know they they are supposed to be flamboyant and all? Nothing. You know, uh, I spent uh, seven years as a bachelor in Adampur. Adampur is twenty kilometers from Jalandhar Kant. Okay. And in in the sixties, that was the boondocks, you know. Mm. And once you came to Adampur base, there were no young women around. The only few wives of married officers. Oh. And uh, so all all that we had was airplanes to fly, the squash court or the shuttle court in the evenings, and. Uh, the mess life and that's it there, there were no young women around to show off or do okay. anything about. and there were no women officers <laughs> at that time <laughs> these days things are very different so did you date anyone or straight away you married i met sheila when i was on leave here okay and and then we dated and we corresponded then we got married yeah how did you propose to her it happened in koshi's you know koshi's restaurant right right um we were sitting there in the evening when it, there was some cyclone or something in the bay and all cats and dogs and uh, we were stuck there for about three hours and I think finally we ran out of conversation and I said, will you marry me? And uh, <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> that, that was your last conversation? conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did she say? She said yes, but uh, there was in the usual little bit of well, family hassles and all. But fortunately, my father happened to know her father. Okay. So he, the the two men met and <laughs> they decided to. And it's, uh, it's been how many years now? Fifty-four. Fifty-four years. Yes. Wow. And many more years to go, sir. <laughs> <laughs> If if you have to give any advice to all the husbands there, what would you say? Uh, long marriages don't happen overnight. They happen one day at a time. And you have to keep working at it every day. And what is the mantra of a happy married life for all the husbands? Um, secret of success is yes, dear. And sorry, dear. Well, <laughs> yes. yes. If you could... Have any historical figure in your cockpit as a co-pilot? Who would that be? As a fighter pilot, I would like to have a guy called um, Hans Joachim Marseille. He was the m- most aggressive fighter pilot in the Luftwaffe. He got killed when he was just 21 years old, but he had already shot down 157 aircraft, most of it in North Africa, and uh, he he was the epitome of the Aggressive fighter pilot Hans Joachim Masai <coughs> for a fighter sortie on a long flight probably Birbal okay so they keep you amused yeah right <laughs> and on a short um, Roger Federer maybe he is uh, one of my guys I placed right up there both for his achievements and for his behavior who's your favorite tennis player now these days I am rooting for uh, Alcaraz. Alcaraz. Oh, that that boy is just phenomenal. Yeah. We we are uh, tennis heads. We keep discussing that. Okay. Yeah. But it's going to be a great tussle between Sinner, Alcaraz, uh, right. Olga Rool. There's a new crop coming up. Medvedev. And Medvedev. Poor chap. He, every time this happens, he's, he's taking two, two sets, sets up two, and then two, losing and the then next three sets. It. It's so sad for him. Yeah. What's the significance of Bangalore in your life? See, Bangalore, 
my father was in the state government medical service so I was born in a place called Davangere which is north of Bangalore right but when i was just 6 months old i came here as as a baby and i grew up here in bangalore and i my father went away to fight the japanese in burma in the indian army medical corps right so my mother was staying with my father's mother you know we had a house in shivaji nagar in that area somewhere that tasco town you know harsha hotel there's a hotel called harsha hotel right next to that and i have seen bangalore from the time i was 3 4 years old it was full of whites full of brits and then in 47 happened and they all went away and sometime in may there was a victory parade here in bangalore and this victory parade took place between queen victoria statue and king edward statue in cobham park and some armored cars and all went past and we all waved the union jack okay the, the british flag we were given and we waved it and those troops were all smiling and waving at all of us that was the victory day parade of 1945 then dad came back from the, the army in early 47 and we went to mysore so in august 1947 15th august 1947 dad took us to the local maidan for the flag hoisting and that was the first time i saw the tricolor right wow and i said what's happened to the union jack he said forget about the union jack this is your flag now <laughs> 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 Wow. Yes. <laughs> and where the, the KSC Chinnaswamy Stadium is today, that whole area between Queens Road and Central Street, that whole area, it was a huge entertainment city called Hollywood City. So you had Ferris wheels and you had merry-go-rounds and you had shooting galleries and beer pubs and um oh. small movie halls. Uh, right up to 46 and then we went away to mysore and when i came back a couple of years later the whole place is emptied out they said where is where is the army camp they said they've all gone out to kashmir okay to fight <laughs> pakistan <laughs> yes and then you go to lake view milk bar and have your milk shakes and ice cream so in your car so across your the car. road across the road yeah. sitting there still there and uh, bangalore my life revolved around four movie theaters liberty plaza which has now become that metro uh thing uh, rex which was down brigade which is road. a mall now and then a uh, little further up was imperial imperial theater okay those are the memories of bangalore my brigade road koshi there is a place called koshis where the favorite thing which we college students used to go and have is something called iced tea Right, four thirty-six paisa. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so out of my eighty-three years, I've probably spent something like sixty years in Bangalore, and I've seen the transition of Bangalore from a sleepy town of the forties, and in the forties it was a garrison town full of troops, um, American GIs, British Tommies. and hl was set up in 1940 and it was the main maintenance base for southeast asia command and all kinds of planes used to come here for overall so i have seen spitfires and mustangs and all those flying around from the time i was a kid and then the gradual transition of bangalore from uh, there was a huge influx of people from the outside and then the it boom and uh, the local kannadigas felt threatened because today as we speak the 52% of the population of bangalore are non kannadigas but i must say that bangalore the most enduring feature of bangalore is that it is an extremely cosmopolitan city like none other in india i would say chennai is very tamil kolkata is very bengali right Uh, and Delhi is very UP Punjabi right 
Mumbai is also cosmopolitan, but not to the same extent as Bangalore. Right. And uh, if you go to Thiruvan- Thiruvananthapuram, it's totally Malayali. Yeah. Right. right. So this is very special, Bangalore. Very special. Bangalore is special, and I'm with a special person. Uh, well, my guest today, Air Marshal Philip Rajkumar, retired. The icon of Bangalore. This is the Tuhin Show.